Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, we are hosting our first Friday Lunch and Learns. We've been on a little bit of a break uh, the last two months for summer, but we're back at it. Um, we're very excited to have uh, Chancellor's Professor Paul Durish presenting today. So thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, so first we'll go ahead with just a couple um, housekeeping items. There's a couple items to share. The power, there we go. Oh. So um, last weekend, our board was able to get together for the first time in about a year and a half since the pandemic started. So um, a big thanks to VJ, who's on the picture on the right. Um, he hosted our barbecue. So we had um, the whole ICS chapter alumni board um, there with our spouses and all our children. It was really fun. We had all the kids playing and got to catch up with each other and um, just have a nice time and chat about the year ahead coming for uh, the alumni chapter. So it was really nice. Uh, thanks to VJ and everyone for attending. Um, also wanted to highlight that our chapter won the uh, alumni engagement award for the last two years. So. I think that's a pretty great achievement to celebrate, um, seeing that we started basically right before COVID started. And so we had to figure out a way to get all of our alumni engaged. And we think that the Lunch and Learns are, are doing pretty well. So we're going to keep those going. And we have our first in-person event since COVID started uh, coming up this month. So that's really exciting. Um, we're gonna do a Halloween mixer. So it'll be a costume contest. So there's different uh, prize categories, a little bit similar to what we did last year, um, but last year's was virtual. So this year it will be um, the end of the month on October 28th, mark your calendars. It'll be in Tustin at the Casa del Sol outdoor patio. So um, keep tuned on your email and social media for um, announcements of that. But these are this is the date and time and location that we've set. So we hope you can all join us. It would be really great to see um, as many of our alumni as possible in person. So we also um, are going to keep doing the lunch and learns and um, we're going to be looking to set up a game night. Um, I don't know that we've set the month for that yet, Jamar, but I think uh, that will be coming up soon. Uh, we also are in continuing the lunch and learns. We're looking for um, any additional speakers. Uh, if you have a topic that you would like to talk about, um, please feel free to reach out to the chapter um, through any of the social media channels or through email directly. Um, that would be that would be great. And um, we also encourage you to sign up for the AntNet, which uh, the link is is in these slides, so we can. Um, Help you get set up with that if you need. And without further ado, I will pass the, the mic and the screen to Professor Durish to talk about um, the newly founded Create Center. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to share any slides, I think. I think I'm just going to, uh, just going to talk and hopefully uh, have enough time that, that we can be fairly, fairly interactive. So it's, um, so nice to be able to, to be here and be invited. It's especially nice. <laughs> um, Lily took the first two undergrad classes that I ever offered at UCI. And so I have, um, while I have a great fondness for all my students, I have a special fondness for those who, <laughs> who, su who suffered through things as I was trying to figure out how, how anything worked. Um, Pooja took one of them a little later, as I recall. Such fun um, memories of your classes, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the nightmares, nightmares. They were the best. <laughs> What I also realized after spending the last year and a half teaching via Zoom and things, but I've been doing that at home, and I'm realizing at home, I've got my audio setup, lighting dialed in really nicely. I've got that under control. But here in my office, now that we're back on campus, um, the lighting is terrible, but never mind. Um, um, we, will, we will struggle struggle on. So yeah, so what I want to tell you about um, is the new center, which um, we sort of started at the beginning of the calendar year um, and we're running here in ICS which is CREATE and that's the, the Center for Responsible, Ethical and Accessible Technology. 
Um, so the, the context for establishing it um, is that uh, Vincent and Amanda Steckler um, made a very generous philanthropic gift to the campus, actually hugely generous. They, they, they gave a large, a large gift to ICS and also a large gift to the, the art history program um, with the intention of establishing this center for looking at questions of uh, responsive, social responsibility, um, technological impacts, how we can think about uh, diversity and equity in workplace uh, participation in big tech and all the questions that are sort of on the, you know, the front page of the newspapers, especially like this week, right? So this week we have um, the fallout from the, the Facebook files uh, published by the Wall Street Journal last week and questions about health and safety online and social media. So these are topics that are very prominent, topics that are very pertinent, topics that um, that, that require a good deal of attention. There are also, of course, as most of you will know, topics that um, ICS has been uh, very active in ever since the, since the department was founded in the late 1960s. There has always been a strong interest in the, the social aspects of information technology, the social consequences of digitization, computerization, and so forth. But of course, again, these things need to be renewed and invigorated and the context right now, the context uh, of, of sort of contemporary um, technological platforms and technological implications is very different than, uh, than, it, than it was uh, in, the, in the late 60s and 70s. So the, the create, setting up the center allows us to build on that legacy and that history um, to expand it, to amplify the work that people here in ICS and at UCI have been doing for, um, uh, for such a long time, um, to project it onto a national and international stage, um, to suffuse it throughout the curriculum, because that's, I think, something that everybody recognizes is tremendously important right now, is to understand how these questions of responsibility and ethical practice can be incorporated into and throughout our teaching. Um, um, and, to, and to build connections um, across the campus and, and beyond. Um, these are central topics for ICS, but they're not solely the topics for ICS. Um, so we're using the center to knit together interests across the informatics department where I'm based, the computer science department and the statistics department where we have many people who have different um, uh, kinds of disciplinary uh, um, insight into the questions. But we're also looking at this as an opportunity to engage with people from the law school, from social science and social ecology, from the humanities and from the arts. And, and, um, and indeed, we already, if you go and look at the, uh, the Create webpage, you'll see we already have a, um, um, a good deal of participation from those places. Because the challenges that we're sort of facing uh, um, are ones that escape any one discipline, no one department, no one program. Uh, no one school has all the has all the answers, and it's only in partnership that we're going to be able to uh, to, to to make change. So, um, the what I want to sort of point to in particular that is very important to me is the way in which the center is set up in order to be able to have sustainable impact. So, in academic life, we are also often funded by grants from places like the National Science Foundation or organizations like the Ford Foundation or the MacArthur Foundation and so forth. And what happens is somebody gives you a pile of money and that's lovely. And then you spend that pile of money for a while. And then after a couple of years, you've spent all the money and the activity um, uh, may stop or at least be transformed. And now you need to go and get more money and things like that. So it's hard to build sustainable partnerships with both on campus and off campus, with off campus organizations, with community organizations and so forth. One of the things that's super important to me about how CREATE is set up is that it is set up for sustainable partnerships because the center has an endowment. It's not just that we're, we're able to go in France, although of course we are, but you know, when you have an endowment, that basically means you are living and operating on the interest earned and accumulated on the capital that was that, that was uh, gifted. Um, and what that means is 
um, as I said to somebody the other day, the center should be around for a long time, at least until the collapse of capitalism. Um, that is, we will be, we can, we can go out into the community working with groups who are uh, um, at the sharp end of uh, technological um, discrimination, for example, and we can promise that we're going to be able to be around for the long term to work with them to uh, to to create new sorts of opportunities and to to learn more about what's going on for them. So the fact that it's sustainable, I think, is tremendously important and a really big part of uh, of what we get out of the way in which this has been set up. Now, it's a center and not a research project. So if I did have a grant from the National Science Foundation and you asked me what it was about, I'd be able to tell you what our goals are and our deliverables are and what exactly we're going to do. But a center isn't like that. A center is not a project. So I can't tell you what the goals of the project are because there isn't one. What a center does is it convenes things. It brings people together who have many different kinds of interests and many different kinds of projects. And what I expect and hope indeed is that every few years there's a new portfolio of projects, a new set of things going on. But let me tell you a little bit about what people are doing or have been doing over the summer, our students have been doing over the summer to give you a flavor of what kinds of things we, we have. Um, so so uh, the first funding we made with the, the, the money from the center was for um, a series of, of grad student projects um, this summer. Uh, a couple of students were looking at uh, what they call digital refuse, the digital detritus, both sort of objects and, um, and data that's left behind in the wake of refugee movements and, um, and refugee actions by, by NGOs. So we're very interested in how it is that people are forced by reason of war or climate change or oppression or um, other forms of uh, persecution, forced to, to leave their countries, to leave their homes, to move around, navigate the worlds in which they move, both I mean, through digital resources, but also end up leaving these trail of, um, of both data and devices uh, in their wake which have um, all sorts of implications, both for privacy um, and for, for environmental impact and so forth. Um, and so, so two of our students, Bono and Lucy, um, have been working with uh, people in Europe who have been themselves sort of managing the flows of, of refugees from, from the Middle East, as well as with refugee communities themselves, to try to think about what the role of digital technology was in the processes that they have been experiencing. Um, a second project was look at the problems of misogyny and harassment in online gaming and game streaming. So you probably would not be surprised to know that, well, first to know, I mean, I think many people will know that the uh, that there's a, a huge interest and explosion in, in online game streaming um, through services like Twitch um, and perhaps not surprised to discover that associated with that, and you can think maybe in the gate in the in the wake of Gamergate and so forth, that there are a lot of also of online abuse, online harassment, particularly of women, also of LGBTQ uh, uh, communities. The particular project we've been looking at with um, with Amanda Cullen, a PhD student working on this in uh, and also uh, working with Twitch, has been looking at both the sort of nature of misogynistic practice in online spaces, but also what kinds of digital defenses can be formed, what we can do about that, how we want to think about the, the, the problems um, and the kinds of protections that can be built into these platforms um, in the face of the sorts of problems that people experience of that sort. Um, on a more technical front, another of the projects we're looking at over the summer is sort of broadly in the area of explainable AI. And I think of this as sort of explainable and tunable AI. So um, most AI systems uh, are trained up on large amounts of data, and then you sort of essentially, you build a model of the world that then you activate in order to be able to uh, make decisions. You look at past data in order to decide how you're going to administer healthcare or how who's going to be granted a loan and things like that. Um, but those systems are very brittle in that they generally can't explain themselves. Um, they've got large amounts of data, but they don't have much of a symbolic description of what of the decision-making process. So many people, including 
uh, Samir Singh down in the computer science department, he's been a leader in this field, been working on explainable AI systems. How can you take these models and then give somebody an explanation of why a decision was made in a particular way? Well, one of the things that the student we've been working with is interested in is not just how you can give those explanations, but how you can then tune the system in order to do better. How can you understand where it's going to do well and where it's going to do poorly? And how can you make those explanations not to a machine learning or AI expert, but to a domain expert like a banker or um, a financial analyst or a physician or whatever? How can you help those people to understand what the, what the good cases and the bad cases are, and also to then improve the system, to tweak it and twist it and change it in ways that um, are going to produce a result more, more like the one that you want. And so other people in this explainable AI stuff, but the tunable is, um, is a sort of a, a further technical step. And then the last of the four projects um, goes to the, the accessibility component of, of CREATE. And I should say quickly what I mean by that. We do have a lot of research on what's traditionally known as sort of accessible computing or accessibility computing, which thinks about how it is that disability uh, um, affects one's experience of digital technologies and how we can be more inclusive by building technologies um, in support of different kinds of disability communities. And that's part of what we mean by accessibility. But the other thing we mean by accessibility is um, accessible, uh, is making the workforce accessible. How, what are the patterns of employment and recruitment uh, that, and how are, how are we doing in terms of uh, a diverse workforce that reflects diverse experience so that the systems that we build can be um, in tune with, uh, with a wider variety of communities. Um, and so the, the last of the summer projects that was going on, Phoebe Schwa's work, um, had, she's been looking at how, um, how socioeconomic and class factors play into how people get internships at big tech firms. So if you think about recruiting at big tech, that's governed by uh, labor protections and anti-discrimination law. But you think about internships, that's actually not. It's, from a labor perspective, it's a much more gray area. But the two are very directly tied together because by and large, the people who get hired are people who wear interns. Not all the people who are interns get hired, but it's an important pathway into um, tech workforce participation. Um, and so Phoebe has been studying both from the perspective of um, successful and unsuccessful um, applicants for internships, but also from the HR and recruitment side, how it is that people are judged to be um, you know, good fits for a particular firm, good fits for a particular company. So I'm laying these out, I'm not only giving you like the various details, although I'm happy to talk more about, about them, just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we're, we're sort of interested in, the kinds of things that are, uh, that are sort of active projects for us. There's a lot of other things that um, I think we're going to be able to sort of spin up over the course of the, the year, now that we're actually back in person and we'll be able to sort of see each other face to face, even if mask, mask to mask, perhaps, that's what I would say. Um, uh, there's clearly a lot of interest um, and important activity to be done in the area of sort of misinformation and extremism online, how is uh, your political fragmentation and so forth uh, uh, in, uh, in online spaces and how can, what can we do to um, counter, well, well, first to understand that spread of misinformation, but also to be able to sort of counter it, control it and manage it. Um, a second project. Uh, that I think is really important, um, it, and we're going to sort of, I think, build on is some of the work that uh, um, Roderick Crooks, oh, there, there goes my office turning, it's, turning the light off, it's very unhelpful, thank you. Um, Roderick Crooks, who's a, a professor in informatics, the office through the wall behind me, um, has been doing a lot of work on sort of data activism and data justice, and particularly sort of community participation in different kinds of data projects. And that's something I think we're really going to, um, going to do more of. And this is another place where that sustainability of our community partnerships is really important. Um, and then a third thing that uh, is, is, is a big interest for, for many people, especially here in informatics, but not only, are questions of technology and mental health, right? And again, I will point to the, the Facebook files and the stuff that's been going on with um, respect to uh, Instagram and body image issues uh, 
uh, for young women um, as one tiny aspect of a much broader thing about how we think about the relationship between technology and mental health, both in terms of the kinds of problems that can arise, but also where technology can be a useful interventional strategy in order to be able to identify and resolve problems earlier than we can do otherwise. So there's a huge number of things going on. It's a very broad umbrella. It's an intentionally, intentionally broad umbrella because I don't want to sort of narrowly restrict it. I've, my figure, my, I figure that I've got a bunch of ideas about what things can go on, but the point of the center is for to, to bring together 20 or 30 other people who probably have better ideas than I have and certainly have more ideas than I have and, and to be able to sort of like, you know, uh, uh, form new kinds of synergies. And that's where it sort of like reaches out to, you know, our alumni community as well, right? So there's a couple of ways here that I think people can, can think about getting involved and we'd, we'd love to, to have the participation um, of, of the supporters of ICS out in the world. Um, one is that we will be having a series of talks and lectures and, um, and you know, distinguished speakers, people whose work uh, speaks to some of these questions, again, drawing broadly across different kinds of disciplinary interests. I think some of those are going to be virtual. Some of those are going to be, um, are going to be live and in person, I hope, although even for the live and in person, we will have a, a virtual option so that, uh, because, so that actually, well, for two reasons. One, because of course, COVID, but also because we want to make sure that this is projecting beyond ICF and UCI. We want to sort of help to sort of like, you know, contribute to a national conversation. Um, then the other way that uh, that people can get a vote is, is I think, as I've suggested a couple of times, community connections, community partnerships, partnerships with nonprofits, with government, with other sort of parts of our community where some of these questions are being uh, where some of these issues are being worked through in practice is tremendously important to us. And, uh, you know, I have a bunch of contacts that, and, and my colleagues in the center have a bunch of contacts, but this is a place where, where you guys can really be of tremendous value to us as well. So I would hope um, that you can sort of like carry around with you the ideas of what it is that we're doing with the Create Center. And when, you know, you come across something, uh, you, you encounter something where you think there might be a point of connection, please reach out and, um, and help make that connection for us. And we'll see, we'll see what we can, uh, what we can accomplish. Um, and so we're really sort of looking to build those up. It's a sort of odd situation because we started this center in the middle of the pandemic. And as I said, I haven't actually seen most of my center colleagues face to face yet, um, but uh, we're able to move into a different mode now. Um, and that's sort of, sort of really kind of uh, looking forward to that. So I don't wanna talk anymore. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. Well, I'm happy to try to answer any questions. We'll see how, how, how well I do. I can see there are some things in the in the chat. Uh, Nanette, can I do? You, I can just try to read this question out the chat, or uh, or your or. But I don't know if it's sort of formulated as a question that you'd like to uh, like to try. You're sort of asking about about violence in games and and sort of the ethical decisions. I think there's I think there's sort of two ways we can think about or two elements to that that we can sort of think about. One is that one is the question of the ethics of game production, and the other is how we can think about games themselves as sites of um, of ethical practice, particularly perhaps for kids. Um, you know, there are as a hobby project recently I just restored and repaired an, a, an Apple II computer from 1983. I never used an Apple II when I was a kid but I used other computers with the same processor um, and so now I'm sort of exploring various of the famous games that you know were played on the Apple II back in the, back in the 1980s um, you know and there's, there's one of them from the Ultima series that was famous because it sort of gave up on the whole sort of like you have to kill monsters and slay dragons and gather treasure thing and in fact instead sort of started to switch its focus to be the ethical decision making and the sort of virtues expressed by the way in which you play the game. And so I think there is an interesting set of opportunities um, about thinking about games as themselves sites of, uh, of, of ethical participation. Over the last couple of years, we have recruited um, a number of people in ICS who may actually have, have had them come and talk at the, 
um, in these events, and if you haven't, you probably should, uh, who work around, um, work in the, have worked in the game industry and work very closely in partnership with people in games thinking about, um, about these questions, because the issues of um, of gender discrimination, gender violence, uh, and so forth in the gaming community are, are pretty serious and, and disturbingly endemic. Um, and, and many of you might actually even have seen the stuff lately just about um, the organizational cult blizzard and some of the, 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 the questions there about the kinds of places that, from which these games come. Um, and I do, so, so it's a question to which I will defer to others because gaming is not my area, but people like um, Katie Salen and Constance Steinkel are, are, are fabulous people to try to uh, engage with uh, um, around, some of, around some of these questions. Professor Gersh, I'm curious on the topic of um, really social responsibility. Does the center have any plans to try to engage with enterprises that have direct impact on society today, like the Facebooks and the Twitters? Um, you know, like if you think about in the past, there's a, a social etiquette that yep. humans have created with each other to the point that we're you know, used to send our kids to cotillion and educate our kids on, you know, proper manners and how to interact with people. Um, is there, do you see the center trying to get involved with either youth and or these big enterprises that really should, in my opinion, hold yep. some social responsibility for what they're producing? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So, so, I, I, I won't weigh in on the cotillion restoration question, but uh, but but yeah, no, I think one of the one of the questions that I've struggled with over the last few months um, is is quite the right way to do that because the way that the corporations by and large want to engage with you is by giving, um, and if we're actually concerned with ethics and social responsibility, but at the same time we're taking money from Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple, it's uh, not necessarily it's not a good look, let's say, right? Um, but we. I mean, the advantage that we have in some sense is that we have lots of connections with those corporations through students who have graduated and go and work there, um, through research, other forms of research partnership. So we are sort of like feeling our way towards the best way to be to be doing that. I've talked with people from from not all of those corporations, but certainly from from some of them, um, and the the you know the the ethics advisory boards and things like, you know, face what, what's occasionally jokingly called Facebook Supreme Court. Those are also sort of like academically engaged organizations as well. Um, and so, so I think it's really important and it's important in a variety of ways. I think it's important first um, because we can't simply be seen to be scolds and people who, who, are, who are trying to sort of like blow up the corporations, at least not all the time. Um, and we, uh, and, you know, we also have to recognize that those are, those are, you know, places where a lot of our students will go um, and work where, and we, you know, where we can have an influence, but also where we need to be able to sort of maintain, maintain a connection. So I'm not terribly certain yet exactly how best to do, it, and I think it's going to be different for different kinds of um, different organizations, um, but we sort of have in some sense have people I, mean, I shouldn't say this while a zoom is being recorded we sort of have you know we through through our alumni networks um you know we have people in um prominent places inside many of these organizations who can help us find out what's going to be the most effective form of partnership and most effective form of engagement for um for for each one so i think that's really important i mean it's like if we if we didn't if we weren't doing that, we would be very neglectful of our responsibilities. Um, but figuring out just what the best form of partnership is that retains the this critical distance that we need. That's that's going, that's the challenge that's sort of facing me at the moment. Are we allowed just to jump on with questions? Okay. <laughs> Hey, Paul, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Nick. Um, so this is a super cool uh, topic that you're bringing up with this, this center. Um, and I think one of the 
strength of an alumni group is all the different perspectives and all you know levels of people. And I was wondering if it would make sense for the center to have like a reading group of some sort, where you engage us, you know, regularly, where we read a book or whatever, right, and come in and hear from you know, like here. Here's David from Minnesota doing entrepreneurship, and he sees this in. Um, like, like, for example, your, your hiring internship project, right? Mm -hmm. There are things that mm -hmm. I see here mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. might be different from what you see in, the, in Silicon Valley versus, you know, somewhere else. Um, and I think it'd be really nice to see, if not only for, from my perspective or from my view, to hear what others are seeing. But I can add, you know, I, I don't have a, you know, it's one piece of data, but it's, it's, you know, it's one more piece of data. I think that, that'd be fun, at least for, for, from my perspective. Uh, you know, I hadn't thought about that, and I think it's a great idea. I like it a lot. I mean, obviously, those kinds of things are happening in inside the university, right? You know, where yeah, we, yeah. Where, you know, but, um, yeah. but the idea that we might think about that as a more public-facing uh, function um, and one where we where we yeah uh, you know take advantage of our of our alum network as well. Well. Take advantage of maybe just sounds like, <laughs> sound like the appropriate thing to be doing responsible <laughs> leverage but leverage you get what I mean but it's leverage yeah okay there you are um so uh uh and connect with I think that's a really I, I like that idea a lot um so so I I, I just wrote it down um and and we'll have yeah no I, I I think it'd be but, uh, but yeah I think that would I think that would be uh that would be good because I think you're absolutely you're right that part of the part of the challenge is the very sort of multifaceted nature of these questions, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and, and that includes with the disciplinary mix that we have on campus, but it also includes the, um, the, the elements from, from people who are located differently in, in industry and-, and Yeah, yeah. Or, or even just uh, where they're situated in the structure of, of these systems that you're, you're studying, right? So for yeah. uh, hiring. And and within their careers and within yes, different yes. kinds of industry se sectors and different yep. um, you know uh, uh, states and countries and and you know uh, uh, legislative regimes and things. So, yeah, yeah in, in in all those ways. So I like I like that idea a lot. Thank you. Cool. And then uh, the other question I have is, um, it seems like are you actively looking for projects and uh, is there like a call for participation site that you? Um, about these things there there is not although i think when i mean i'm always I, I, if anybody has anything they should send it to me and i will try to root it in the right direction my model is um that the it's not so much that the center is looking around for projects because it's difficult for it's di i can't um I can't wind people up and say, "Here, you will now do this project," right? Um, um, when something comes along, but I can, I can um, uh, enthuse people about it. So, so that I think the sort of the set of interests that the center expresses at any given moment are going to come from the variety of things that the students are interested in, and the, the and you know the, the connections that the faculty have with the rest of it, and conversations with folk like you, and conversations with others that sort of you know because that's where lots of those projects come from. So one of the reasons that it's a little difficult, and I'm being a little uh, vague about things at the moment, is again precisely because we are like one week into our new quarter. We have a whole bunch of fresh new, new new students one of whose names popped by on the screen here at some point so uh you know, who are in, who've got who are bringing with them uh uh new enthusiasms of their own new project ideas and so forth you know i've just been just went for a walk around campus with a with with, with a student who's been working on uh on on how you know protest groups manage their communication in order to be able to resist um, um predatory development practices in south korea and so it's like i mean we've got all sorts of different kinds of things that fall under the umbrella of this and i kind of kind of think that in a few in a you know in in a few months like you know but maybe the beginning of winter quarter well i'll have a sort of a, a, a stronger sense of our, likely to be our themes for this year i'm sort of giving you what i think those might be but, um but i am you know i am always happy to find a point of contact 
within the center for the kind for 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 ideas as they manifest themselves right because there might be things that are you know that that where the person where it like jibes with something that somebody from social ecology is doing and that would yeah, yeah. fit into the fit into the, the the nature of things or where we want to spin up a new kind of activity so i'm sort of looking for those we, one of the things we've been exploring is the notion i haven't figured out how to do this in the university administration yet of a sort of like an, an in residence position, which can be for people from nonprofits and other activist groups, or people who have a sort of a direct um, focus on on the on particular topics and particular communities and particular things of interest, who can then come and spend a few months, like some time outs for them to get some work done, yeah. but also to engage with us again, sort of broadly across ICS and the community, um, um, trying to figure out exactly again. There's, there's, there's all sorts of weird university administration to be figured out about that. But again, as a way of trying to find those sort of points of contact. So like this, um, uh, I should stop to let others talk. <laughs> but if no one's talking, I can talk more. <laughs> Go ahead, David, please. <laughs> okay. So Paul, Paul is my former professor, so we chat. <laughs> um, I was thinking, Paul, so the, the, the center is based inside ICS, yeah? Yes. Okay, so um, I assume there are a lot of, say, sociology students who are working on very similar uh, uh, topics. Yeah. Um, would it make sense for them to reach out to the center? And if they do, what resources do they get if they connect with the center? Um, what, what, what's what's that? How does that work? Um, so there are lots of people broadly across the campus, and I think that's very important for the work of the center. For, for it to be successful, it has to. It, we have to be able yeah. to incorporate uh, um, those perspectives, and we do already have students from other uh, other schools um, participating as, as members of the center. What that has meant by and large so far is that, um, you know, they're part of the conversation. They're part of the community. They're coming to talks. They're, they're engaging with our students. We're learning from them and they're learning from us and so forth. Um, um, I have, there, there's a question of, it's like, I think we can do everything except I'm not sure I can really pay them. <laughs> that's 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 but but that's i think the center also um can hold resources beyond the funding that we already have so i'm absolutely looking at sort of collaborative research projects that will span academic boundaries and span 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 schools which is something uci is generally good at and something that we can do fairly easily um um but uh it is this was this was a gift to ics um and uh, I'm sure Marius will have some ideas if I start to spend most of the money on students from sociology, which is not my, <laughs> not my, not my plan. But uh, but it, but so we're we're figuring out what the best way is to do that. One of the things that a center does, I mean, as you know yourself from for your own time here, one of the things the center does is it provides legitimacy for certain kinds of topics, right? One of the things the center does is it provides a sort of recognition of a broad impetus and a, and a, and and um, uh, an orientation towards certain kind of topics on campus, right? So it, it can be an orienting device. Um, one of the things the center does is to connect students who can then, you know, find ways to be engaged in projects that satisfy their mutual interests, but also satisfy the needs of their different kinds of programs. So there are a lot of things. And then one of the other things it can do, of course, is um, host, uh, you know, visitors, sabbatical visitors, the rest of it who from whom students often like, you know, get a, get a, get a lot. Um, and so there are a whole variety of ways beyond the sort of direct graduate student research or support that I think um, uh, uh, people can get out of this. Um, and, and, you know, we, we put out a call for proposals, uh, you know, for the summer projects, and we're really sort of overwhelmed with how many of the, uh, the responses we got back, and, you know, that were, you know, certainly 60% from ICS, but, but maybe not more than 70. Um, and so, so there is a lot of, there is a lot of interest and uh, that's absolutely part of 
my goal for this. Because again, if we're if we're trying to think about what the policy implications are, and we're not doing that in partnership with people from the law school, it's just not going to work, right? And if you're you're interested in what the sort of like how technology plays into sort of political extremism and social movements, and you're not doing that in conversation with people in sociology and political science, it's not going to work. And so so that's absolutely uh, part of the part of the goal here. So, Professor Durson, on that note, I'm curious um, if you have alum interests, um, would you would you guys consider having alums be part of any research team on a voluntary basis um, to kind of enrich those teams? Because I, when I think about alums, you know, you've got work experience with many of them, so they're mm -hmm. out in the real mm -hmm. world, you know, encountering some of the situations. So, on one hand, they might have interesting data points to bring to the yeah. research team I, I absolutely i think it would be fabulous I'm, I'm again i i would love if people could if people have those sort of uh um things that they recognize that they can bring to it i would say just email me and i'm going to start keeping a big list of, of all the sort of ones and all of sort of points of connection what i also think and as i said one of the things one of the challenges for us although this is a sort of research center one of the things that I think is very important and sort of just sort of on a broader level is the sort of educational component and how it is these things sort of fit into the curriculum. And one of the things that we know um, is very important in sort of like solidifying those understandings for, for students is the opportunity to work with people beyond the university, to work with people in operations, right? You know, you guys all took uh, um, you know, did, did, did project classes there where you had external clients and things. So I think partnerships of those sort are, 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 there's many different ways that we can do that. And I'm certainly going to see a direct need for that within the sort of educational stuff. But I would love to be able to sort of match up research projects with external participants, external advisors, people who are members of the research team who can bring a new kind of perspective into the, into the conversations that are, that are going on. I think that would be tremendous. And I so I, I just to, I'm happy to be the point person for all those things. I already get so much email that there's really nothing you can do to like uh, <laughs> to, to like you know uh, make it explode it. So it's like really I can I can call it some extra email. It's fine. Yeah. So I I think that that what Lily said is exactly a really cool resource, right? If you could um, craft a you know I need I need help with this to the alumni. Right. I suspect there's tons of us here who, you know, are at various different in industries now. We've gone right. all crazy places, right? And we would love to provide data, to give feedback, to, you know, just to <laughs> hear ourselves talk, maybe. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right that the alumni network is not something that I had um, been recognized as as an opportunity that I should tap right or as a resource that I should tap and um and you guys are, are helping me helping me recognize that I was a, a, an oversight on the part. um so so I am I'm yeah eager to exploit you all <laughs> leverage leverage <laughs> Damn, I put it on a, I put it on a post it note on my screen <laughs> leverage leverage <laughs> We can't hear you. Uh, there's some something I can't hear. Jamar, was that you? You're not muted. I think it's actually the yeah, microphone. Something's funny with your mic. My tech support has gone down. <laughs> <laughs> support needs tech support. <laughs> How about now? Is that still is that better or is that worse? That's it. There you go. That's it. Okay. I just had to, I had to really unmute. Um, so yeah, to, to give, I guess, like a half-hearted plug, maybe not a half-hearted plug, but a, a plug for the alumni chapter. One of the things that we are trying to do is to build up committees to be able to have structures like these, like you know, for outreach. And so mm -hmm. I think that where, you know, for, I guess, folks that are on the call that are alum, or even folks that are um, watching this after um, I'm, I'm talking to people in the future, um, I'd say feel free to reach out to us because we are putting together, um, you know, the committees and the chair people in place to be able to have that sort of outreach and that sort of not even just networking within our within our chapter, but to be able to have that, you know, those conduits into the department, uh, into the school rather. <laughs> I'm not an undergrad anymore into the school and to um, I think it would be 
if we can have that sort of relationship and be able to put in those, you know, to have a, um, um, some, something um, uh, uh, explicit or at least uh, uh, just be very, um, uh, just, you know, plan around uh, being able to have those, uh, those connections. I, I would love to be able to do that within the chapter. And I think that, you know, um, for those of you who are interested, reach out to us as well, and we can also connect um, yeah. in with, uh, with you, Professor Dirsch. Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be tremendous. In the interest of time, I'll ask if there's, if there's any more questions for Professor Dirsch. Do you want to keep people too long on a Friday? <laughs> Well, and again, I would say, again, speaking to future people in that lovely phrase, it's like, you know, um, for others who others who see it afterwards, um, um, I'm happy to to answer questions in, in email, take, or like reach out on social media. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you um, sharing all about the Create Center. It's very exciting. I think it's a, a topic that probably everyone has anticipated for a while um, and is very much needed in the world today. So very exciting. Uh, I, I'm again, flattered by the invitation. I'll be happy to come back and talk at some future time about what's actually happening there uh, and, and you know, some of the some of the things that start to come out from, from those engagements. Yeah, even having some of the student teams do Absolutely. presentations, this would be yeah. awesome. It would be very well received. Um, so let's see, I'm just going to switch back. I think uh, I think it's just a thank you slide with our oops. Yeah, I'll probably do, I, I won't bring up the um, the PowerPoint because I went on to other slides. So we'll just we will call it a wrap and um, we hope that we will see all of you at our in-person event this month in costume professor Durish, you're very much invited <laughs> we had some good costumes last year so um it should be fun we're happy to see everybody and um thank you all for taking the time to attend and listen and support uh professor Durish and the new center at ics thank, thank you, you so all. much great thanks everyone thanks professor Durish. Thank you all. thanks lily